Welcome to the preaching and teaching series of House on the Rock, Lagos, Nigeria. Something is about to happen in your life. And now, here is Pastor Paul and Judges 7, verse 15 to 19. The New Living Translation, I read from the 15th verse. And the chronicler writes, I read, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up for the Lord. Listen, has past tense, given past tense, you, definite article, victory over the Midianite hordes. He's not going to give you the victory. He has given you the victory. Verse 16, he divided the 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. Blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too, all around the entire camp and shout, Sorry, keep your eyes on me when I come to the edge of the camp and do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too. All around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. And suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jar. My subject this morning is... Coaching for Conquering. Coaching for Conquering. Subtitle, Enlightenment for Empowerment. You will not leave here the same way you came in. Our Father, we thank you for the word. Help us to exegete life from the text and from the background story. And rivet your people till they are so stitched to the fabric of this word. And it becomes part and parcel of everything they are. May each man, each woman, each adult that is young, adults that are old, go through the necessary evolution consequent to your predetermination and the release of this word into their life in Jesus' name. We thank you for bountiful victories on every side and of every type. May healing take place. May correction take place. May enlightenment take place. May courage be imbued. And may audacity come upon your people. We pray that you do much more than we ask in Jesus' name. And the people of God said a very big amen. Do be seated in God's presence. It's interesting to note that the human being of all mammalian species, who are the most like them amongst animated species, are designed particularly to evolve. That means you do not have to stay who you are or where you are or what you are today for the rest of your life. You can evolve. And the human mind is capable of this consequence simply because it is a thinking mind. It has the ability to calculate, to deduce, to imagine, to memorize on a similar level to God. It's the only species that was made in the perfection of his likeness. And so you have this huge opportunity to be an evolver to be a transformed person, to be a person who undergoes unique advancement so that what you are today is not what you will be tomorrow. And the progress will not be regression. Instead, it will be progression, advancement of who you are, how you think, what you can do, what you can attain so that when people look at you today, they will not be able to reconcile who you were four years ago or even one year ago. Because you will grow in stature, you will grow in wisdom, you will grow in favor with God, and you will grow in favor with man. So that even you yourself, when you look back at photographs from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, a year ago, you will see a difference. When you look at your stock and what God has given you stewardship of, you will recognize that it's far more than it was many years ago or even a few years ago. When you look at your impact and the role you play in society, the role you play in community, the role you play in industry and in the markets, your growth is going to be quantum. And I want to make clear today that this is is a watershed moment. 
This is a Rubicon, and by the time you leave this service today, your thinking is going to change in such a way that you will not be able to remain who you are today. You will become something much bigger, much greater, much better, much wiser, more responsible, more impactful, more helpful, more useful to the Almighty God. If you don't believe it, please act important. But if you do, I want you to slap somebody high five, tell them you're, he's talking about me right now. And, and so... Uh, if you can't handle that uh, then you certainly ha can't handle people like me because if who you are right now is already too much for other people to handle they ain't seen nothing yet because if you stay under word like this and are a student of the scriptures and a scholar of bible prophecy you will recognize that we are in the last times and in the last days and god's going to do a quick work amidst his people which is not necessarily going to be painless but it will have some pain associated with it but compared to the joy that comes after the pain it is incomparable hallelujah to God so if you think that I am too much to handle right now in a year from now you are going to have a big headache hear, hear me somebody what I mean to say is that your past does not have to determine your future your history doesn't have the power to determine your destiny unless you allow it your yesterday has no power over your tomorrow no matter how ghastly your yesterday was or how terrible it was there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and when sinners plunge beneath that flood they lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may you and I see all our plagues our plight our past washed away so that God can give you a full release into a tomorrow that is unbelievable a tomorrow that will completely leave you irreconcilable to how you got to where you will be in tomorrow's dawn can I get a witness from somebody because too many of us uh, we look at a slice in our lives uh, and we judge the potential outcome our life, of our lives based only on the slice but what you must understand is that a slice loaf of bread has maybe about 15 20 slices depending on how big it is and you can't judge the whole loaf by one slice this season in your life is a passing moment this era in the nation Nigeria is a passing moment this time amongst African personalities it's not a moment that is going to last forever my pronouncement over your life is that this too will pass now all of you who are not going through a nice and dandy time you're not in your best season right now things are not working out for you I want you to stand to your feet as an acknowledgement that I'm going through a slice it's not very nice it's not very comfortable it could be a lot better it's you that I want to talk to in part this morning particularly this too will pass one prophet said it this way uh, trouble don't last always meaning trouble is not going to sit on you forever this trouble has come but it will also go and by the time you come out of this trouble you will be on a whole new trajectory a whole new pathway and a whole new modus that's going to transform your thinking first and then it will ultimately transform your entire life you are going to become so attractive to the power of God that's intentional released to you and from within you and upon you to progress you powerfully into the future that God intended for you if you don't believe that please just stand straight but if this is your word shout I believe, I believe. shout it again I believe what you just said is I believe and believe is the fundamental pivot of all New Testament truth New Testament is not about I do it's about I believe and therefore I do so that your faith has a, a, a verification by your action that produces the raw results upon which God said if you hear me and you do and believe or believe and do what I ask you you're going to get the results that I promised you when I gave you the promise hallelujah shout it again and I believe that everything God says about me and to me it is going to come to pass he is not a man not only can he not lie he does not lie everything he said it's going to happen you may be seated 
So who you used to be doesn't have to determine who you can be. The past doesn't have to determine your future. Your yesterday doesn't have to determine your tomorrow. Your, your history cannot determine your destiny. Why? Because we serve a God who predetermines and empowers us to undergo evolution, to undergo advancement, to undergo unique progress. And if you look back at your life and you see that you evolved in ways you never thought possible, then you need to just look back and say, God, I thank you that the handiwork of your faithfulness is very clear upon my history so I can rest assured in blessed assurance that my future is going to be better than my past. Can you believe that? Can you rise to that responsibility to believe that what you've been through so far, it's not your best days. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are in front of you. Glory to God. And so what I mean to say is that even, even you, at this stage in your life, you are surprised at how much God has done in your life. You had a plan and a hope that he would do this much, but he did exceedingly, abundantly, far above all that you could ask or think. So even you are surprised by your own transformation all evolution my friends begins for us with a psychological shift in our thinking meaning that everything that's going to happen in your life happens psychologically first you come out head first Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 Paul says it this way that we are transformed by the renewal of our minds to know and to experience what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? When you look at it in the New Living Translation, it comes through clearer. Could you deliver that to me? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you or evolve you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect it's pleasurable to you and to him it is very good and it is perfect for you it's suited to you like a several row garment evolution always occurs head first evolution is always an attitude matter it is always a mentality matter it is always about a thinking change a thinking shift so that the actions and the developments that happen in your in your life are active but they didn't begin with action they begun with a change in your thinking hallelujah and so when we look at the animals that god created also of mammalian species you will see the eagle that it can open up its wings and it will catch a wind and soar over a mile above the planet hallelujah to God and we look at it and we can't fly hallelujah then you look at the cheetah it can it can accelerate from zero miles per hour in two and a half seconds to 62 mph if a cheetah chase me it's gonna catch me because I can't run as fast. I'm not designed for that speed. The lion, on the other hand, is powerful. If it was a hungry day and I was in its field or in its territory, that lion would have me for lunch with its raw, its paw, and its canine teeth. Hallelujah. So if we are the, the, the pinnacle of the species of created beings, how do I stand up against a rhinoceros? How do I stand up against a hippopotamus? How do I stand up against an elephant or, or a lion? How do I stand up against a cheetah or, or an eagle who could pick me off any time they wanted to? Uh, yet I am supposed to be the, the pinnacle of the created species of animals, hallelujah, of uh, created beings, of animated beings. So you would say the cheetah has its weapon speed, the lion has its weapons raw and paw and jaw. You would say that the eagle has its weapons wings, talons and a powerful beak. You would say that the snake has its weapon, it slithers quietly and it has poison as its venom. You would say that the, the, the hippopotamus has its weight and so does the rhinoceros, its unicorn and so does the elephant, its tusk and its trunk. So what weapon do you and I have? I'll tell you what our weapon is. I can't fight an eagle because it can fly but I can't. But I have something more powerful. I can't fight a lion because it will beat me up in a hurry. But I have a weapon more powerful than its jaw and its roar. I can't fight the snake. It has poison. And one good bite I could be dead in less than 20 minutes. Hallelujah. But God would not leave us without a weapon. And the weapon that you have to defeat every foe is your mind 
The mind is a dangerous thing. Don't lose it. Use it. Because if you use that weapon called your mind, though you cannot fly, you can study the eagle and then you can build a vehicle that flies. We fly to the moon now. We fly near Mars now. We fly uh, satellites into the air. We fly planes across the planet. We have planes that seat over 500 people. Why? The mind. We can't beat a lion. You know why? Because a lion, if it runs after you, you have to stop it dead in its track with a missile. And our primitive missiles were bows and arrows. But now we have gunpowder. We have bullets. We have firepower. The mind. Hallelujah. I can't outrun a cheetah, but I can design a Bugatti. A motorcycle that will get to 62 mph faster than the cheetah and then sustain speed of about 240, 300 mph for as many hours as necessary. Look at somebody and tell them, you are amazing. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. But you'll never tap into the fullness of your potential if you stay a seed and don't become a thicket. Can I go further? So what it tells me is that God deliberately made you with the most powerful mind of all species. I, I can tell you that there is suspicion in the scientific world that the whale and the dolphin are more intelligent than the human being. But the difference between them and us is the thumb. We can create because we have a thumb. And the thumb can cause grip. And with grip, we can manufacture. So whilst whales are proven to be more intelligent than man, their communication system, systems have much more verbiage and articulation than we do. But they can't craft a canoe. They can't make anything. But they save ships. They save mariners. They cooperate with mankind. And they understand us perhaps more than we understand them. Perhaps. You have a mind. And with that mind, if you allow God to shift it, he can shift your whole life. All change starts with a mental shift. So your evolution into the greatest yet version of yourself is contingent on you allowing God to develop in you the mentality of a winning warrior. A warrior who wins against all your personal battles of life and our community battles of life. So we look at Christ who epitomizes that warrior. And he has two main characteristics I want to examine today. Two main attributes. He's known as many things in the Bible, but the two I want to examine today is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The lamb is docile, it's submitted, it's submissive. It has a herd type of mentality. It will go with the crowd. It will submit to mom and dad. It will submit to the shepherd. It will go wherever the rest of the flock is going. It will take a, a beating and it will just cry, meh, meh, meh. Jesus had that attribute. But he was thankfully not just a lamb, he was also the lion of the tribe of Judah. That means he had resilience, he had audacity, he had tenacity, he had the ability uh, to move, he had the ability to leap and to bound, he had this feeling that I own everything. And that's the nature of the lion. The lion is called the king of the jungle. It's not the strongest, it's not the weightiest, it's not the most intelligent it's not the most powerful. There are many other animals that are more powerful than it, but it is clearly, in their understanding, the king of the jungle. Because of its mind. It's the most sophisticated mind of all the feline species and most animated species. The lion is an overcomer. Just like Jesus, he overcame everything, including the three last enemies, death, hell, and the grave. And the grave, I'll highlight for a moment, the grave had used death as an emissary and brought forth hell as a summons and then locked his body up in the grave. And for everybody who saw him die, they knew it was final. But what was final to the rabbit and final to the cheetah and final to the eagle when it got shot and killed was not final to the lion. So it's not over when the lion is the subject of the ordeal. 
That means that, friend, no matter how bad things get and people have written an obituary about you and published your obsequies and said, this is the way we're going to do the commemorative service for the man that is dead, the devil is a liar. Because a lion will know that the lamb can go down into the grave, but it's an opportunity for metamorphosis, what they call evolution in biology, for the lion to replace the lamb. Glory to God. Please give me a witness, somebody. The grave is not your end. They can bury you, but they don't realize that when they buried you, you were not dead. You were just in a moment of transformation, metamorphosis, evolution. You would not come back the same way you went down. You went down a lamb, but you're going to come up a lion. You see, when, you, when the, the, the agriculturist plants a seed, uh, what he's doing is putting it down in the ground. Uh, when the undertaker plants a man or puts a man in a grave he doesn't expect the man to come back up because that is a burial a funeral same action same earth same hole but the outcome is that the undertaker doesn't go back to inspect to see if there's any growth from what he put in the ground but Jesus defined himself as a seed and he said like a kernel of wheat except it goes down into the ground and dies it abides alone but when I die I'm not going to be alone anymore. In fact, the reason why I die is so that I can multiply. Hallelujah. And so the undertaker has left. And he's never going to find a living body where he put a dead body. But the difference with you is that you were planted what the agri what the undertaker plant buried was a body but they buried you as a seed that means they covered you up with dirt they threw dirt in your face they slandered you they maligned you they put their foot on you then they put a concrete slab on top of where they buried you and they thought you were never coming back but the devil is a liar you are about to make a comeback you are about to show that you are not merely a lamb only but you are also a liar a lion will break brass bars and iron doors. A lion will break out of a cage if you let it and you feed it right. I don't know who the lions are, but I'm expecting in about 10 minutes you are going to roar and show off the fact that you're not a lamb, you're not a weakling, you're not a meow, pussycat, kitten, that you are a lion just like the lion of the tribe of Judah. If that's you, I want to hear your roar for 10 seconds. Everything they threw at him, he overcame it completely. There wasn't one battle that he lost. And even when he looked like he lost, it was his greatest victory. He swallowed up the grave in victory. He chewed up death and hell like they were chewing gum and then spat them out and made open spoil of them on the cross of Calvary and displayed his glory on Sunday morning so that though Friday happens, he lets us know Sunday is coming. Lock me up on Friday night in a grave bury me and roll a tomb stone against my tomb wall on Saturday keep me there all night but let me get to Sunday morning if you let me get to sunshine morning if you let me get to resurrection morning if you let me get to Sunday morning you are not going to see a lamb creep out of the shrine or the sepulcher you go have to encounter a lion if you believe it sound raw if we too are going to accomplish all that God wants us to accomplish and win every war that he puts in front of us, we have to become like Jesus. We have to think the way he thinks. We must undergo a mental shift. We too are going to have to hold on to, in perfect tension, the balance between lamb and lion. The balance between these two attributes. In other words, to know when to be a lamb, and when to be a lion. Because when you are going through tests and trials and troubles in your life, and trouble now knocks on your door, you have a decision to make. Who are you going to send to the door, your lamb or your lion? When trouble knocks at your door, you send the, lion, the lamb into the back room, and you send the, the lion to go open the door. When the lion opens the door and he sees a predator, a breach of security, he roars. And the roar will paralyze the predator to give the lion a chance to choose which of his blows he will give to the, the, the predator. 
a right cross, a left hook, a few jabs, an uppercut, or some kung fu. Don't send the lamb to the door. Put him in the back room. Send the lion to open the door to protect the territory. Because what you, what you do, don't overcome, it will overcome you. What you don't attack, it will attack you. What you don't wrestle, it will wrestle with you. What you don't conquer, will conquer you. What you don't slay, it will slay you. They say, especially the Israelis, attack is the best form of defense. Life is never about what happened to us or what happens to us. It is always about how we see what happens to us. Because victory, my friends, is determined by how you see what happens, not by what happens. Do we let the sheep bleat? Because we think this conqueror will destroy me? Or do we let the lion roar? Listen to this about evolution. Evolution is change, it's advancement. And it first means that you have to tap more and more and more into the lion attribute. So evolution is simply being more and more and more like Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Being like a lion has its dividends. What I'm trying to tell you is that being a lamb makes you a good person. But being a lion gives you a good life. So that if you're only a lamb, you'll be a good person, but you'll be sleeping underneath the bridge. You'll be average and plateau on the place called mediocre. You'll have privilege, never be able to enjoy it. you have the potential, but never maximize it or capitalize on it. But that's why you have to also become a lion. Because the lion, he believes that everything belongs to him. He believes that he is heir of the whole jungle. He believes that the whole territory belongs to him. And this is properly and veritably New Testament. We are heirs of God, the Bible says in the New Testament, and we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to Christ, and he gladly shares it all with us. So we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Please give me a witness. Can I go a little further? I'm getting into the lion in a moment. And so Psalm 126 and verse 1 and 2 says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Israel, Zion, we were like those who dreamed. God's going to give somebody a breakthrough this week. And your dream faculty is going to come back to life again. God's going to break you through to a whole new level. And as a result of that breakthrough, your ability to envisage your future as an imminent reality will return to your faculties, to your faith to your emotions to the way you see yourself and the way you see your tomorrow so he goes on to tell us in verse 2 of Psalm 126 then as a result of God turning our captivity and we now started to dream then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue with singing and then the heathen the unbelievers said look at what the Lord has done in the great things he has done for Israel hallelujah what he's telling is your story that right now you feel caged like Joseph in the pit or in the prison uh, but God's going to turn your captivity Joseph uh, and when it happens uh, you are going to dream on another level on the level of kings that you'll be interpreting kings dreams you'll be operating on a global level not just a national level hallelujah somebody and as a result uh, 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 what will happen is the heathen will recognize the transformation the evolution in your life that you're not a pit boy anymore you're not a prison inmate any longer you're not daddy's boy with a colored coat you are god's king over the nations of the world hallelujah somebody and even they will acknowledge that god has done great things for you it won't be you telling your testimony they're gonna come and blow your horn and god's horn on your behalf who am i talking to this sunday morning if that's you say i'm going to get a mind shift tell somebody else I'm gonna get a mental shift 
So one of the first things you have to know about the lion, I'm going to give you some attributes of the lion, is the lion has amazing eyesight. Uh, the great thing about the eyesight of a lion is it has 600% better eyesight than the human being. It has 600% better eyesight, not just in daylight, but also at night time. That means it can see in the dark. Uh, a lion sees things differently from other species and animals. Uh, and when it gets dark, uh, uh, most people stop hunting. Uh, most people stop building. Uh, most people stop operating uh, because at night you cannot see to work. Uh, but the lion is different. Uh, when night comes uh, and it's in dark times, uh, that's when the lion arises. Uh, that's when the lion is aroused. In fact, the lion does most of its hunting in the darkness. Uh, and that means that you have been through dark seasons before in your life. Uh, but as a lion, uh, whenever it's dark uh, it loves to hunt whenever it's dark it loves to build whenever it's dark it begins to operate whenever it's dark it begins to advance and evolve when others quit because of the dark lion you advance when others throw in the dark or throw in the towel because of the darkness lion you progress when others go through hard times in an economy like this lions you innovate when other people can't see their way out their way over their way through or their way up a lion sees its way in the darkness in fact in the darkness its eyeballs light up why because you see in the dark oh that is no witness i'm not going on until you give me some witness how many of you know that you see in the dark that's how come your business is prospering in dark times that's how come you get opportunities when others don't in dark times in tough times you make it while others fail it but you keep going why because you have vision you have night vision you have night scope God causes you to thrive where others don't derive hallelujah please give me a witness somebody can you remember some of your dark seasons can you remember some of your dark times can you remember some of the times when it was bleak and black and you know you've been through some dark seasons but God gave you night vision and your eyes lit up in the dark in lion likeness not only do you see differently your relationships become different because you see your king he is your light so that what others can't see you can see what others are blinded for you are given vision for so you have treasure in darkness isaiah said you have secret riches in hidden places they were never hidden from you they were hidden for you so whenever darkness comes god is hiding something from your enemies and his enemies but he's giving you an opportunity because of night vision to see what others cannot see that's why we thrive in tough times dark times are a summons for your calling so great leaders, Nelson Mandela, he was born in the darkness of South Africa. In the darkness of Africa, men like Kwame Nkrumah, Obafemi Awolowo, Unambi Azikiwe, they were born. You are born for tough times. Otherwise, God would have sent somebody else. He sent you for these times. And so your relationships become different because lions are cats, but even in the cat family, they are unique. The lion's uniqueness in the cat family is this. They never travel alone. They never exist alone. They never move alone. They move in prides. They exist in prides. They hunt in prides. They build social architecture of a pride. And they take their places in the pride. And it's a hierarchy. And each office in the pride is unique to the role and the gifting and the age and the stage that each lion or lioness is in. Hallelujah. They rear their offspring in a pride. They hunt as a pride. They move as a pride. They exist as a pride. The males, interestingly, they are not the hunters in the pride. It is the lionesses that do the hunting. Uh, uh, the males are responsible for protecting the territory. They protect the watering hole. They protect and mark the territory, the expanse of the territory, so that the moment there's a breach by a predator, the males will go after the predator. 
and they allow the lionesses to do the hunting because the lioness is more agile, more nimble at her feet. The, the lioness is, is um, more, more agile in her movement and, and the, the lioness has more speed, glory to God. And so she can do a lot more when it comes to that role of providing food for the rest of the pride. Whilst the lion gives direction to where the territory is, he looks after the real estate, he takes care of the big matters. It's not that he cannot hunt, but he knows that ladies, you got it going on in a way that men don't got it going on. And so they understand the division of labor. The, the lioness knows how to arrange the warriors of the team, men and women alike. So they decide whether they're going to circle or synchronize or both on how they attack. And that's why ladies, when when you find a king you just found your release you just found a lion who's not going to stymie you stifle you suffocate you re pre prevent you or prohibit you he's a guy who's gonna let you go because he's secure in who he is and he knows you know what he can do and how bad he can be so he's able to release you can I get the women to just roar for a little moment and let the men know I'm waiting for you to release us. Can I go a little further? So the we women do all the hunting. It's not that the men don't come in sometimes. It's not that the lion doesn't come in sometimes. But ladies, when a lion finds you, when a lioness finds a king, he doesn't cage you. He doesn't stop you. He doesn't limit you. In fact, he says, you go for it, lady. You go build that house. You become CEO of that bank. You go ahead and become CFO of that organization you come out of my shadow and be all you can be do all God called you to be go for it girl you my girl move go run win attack I want all the ladies in the house to get up off your feet and look for another lioness and give another lioness a 10, a high 10 and tell them we need you to win. The family needs you to win. The pride needs you to win. And tell those women I'm a loose lioness. I'm a lioness on the loose. I'm loose to conquer. I'm loose to feed my family. I'm loose to break through on another side and I have a lion in my background who's secure. He's not intimidated. He's not aggravated by me. He's proud of me. And if the fight is too big for me I'll roar and my Lion King will show up to finish the controversy <laughs> ladies don't marry a pussy cat don't marry a kitten the difference between a kitten and a lion is kittens meow but lions roar in fact when the prey sees a lion and a lioness he's more scared of the lioness when she's ready to go for her attack, she's focused. And she's spoken to all the other lions and even the cubs. The cubs are the last line of attack. But the mature lionesses, they're in there. And they come from different angles. Then one set of lionesses will push the prey towards the master lionesses. Ma'am, you have no idea the kind of woman that lives with you in your house. I dare you to release her. I dare you to encourage her. I dare you to let her go. The family needs her ability. It needs her capacity. The money in your hand is not enough to deal with your vision and dream. Let the woman go. When the family is starving, the man will, will complain and probably go into clinical depression. The woman will not let it happen. Whatever she has to do to make it happen. Some of you were born from mothers like that. Some of you, that's why you're here today. You're alive and strong today. Because your mother wasn't going to let your daddy, who was down for a moment, miss it. She said, if you can't do it, I'm going to get up and do it myself. Now all the real men, will you stand up? The real men. That means you are a protector. You are a provider. You are a priest, you are a prophet, and you are a pastor in your family. Those are the kind of men we breed here. And that's why we encourage our women, you know why? So that you will wake up. Not just say, where's my food? But the women must respect that you provided the land. You provided the name. That's why they take your name. And that 
your values become the vision of your family. So the ground is protected. The space is well defended that you know you can fight. And if the fight becomes too big for you, we are on call with your role. That's what a real man is. We provide the space that has all the provisions in it. We defend the space so that intruders cannot seize it. We give vision and value. We give communication to the whole pride. Prides go from anything from four, four lions to 50 lions. You may be seated. So ladies, when you get home, tell your lion king, honey, can I go for it? Don't say, I'm going for it. Pastor said so. I'm not the head of your pride. He is the head of your pride. The Bible says, women, submit yourselves to your own husband. And the power of a lioness is she knows who her husband is. And if he's not a lion, she will make him one without him even knowing. That's a skill of a mother. And if he's a boy and not yet a man, a wife that is a mother will make a boy into a man. Oh, you're not helping me. You better not clap like that. You better not clap like that. You get into trouble. <laughs> Come on, ladies, one more time. Lift your voice and shout, I am a loosed lioness. That means don't wait for you to get permission. Go. Your talent is your permission. Your gift is your permission. Your hunger for a new level is your permission. So lions and lionesses, have distinct roles that other lions in the pride recognize and their communication is articulate and it is intelligent one roar identifies the roarer that this is lion a lion b lion c or lion s d e or f but the roar also communicates important information one roar says there's an enemy approaching another roar says there's prey around. Lunch is ready. Another roar says, I'm hurting. I need help. So there's a roar. And lions roar. In order to be all and do all that God wants you to be and do in your life, you have to be part of a pride so that when you roar, your enemies know that you are not alone that you are connected to 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 other lions that are under military regime when it comes to urgency or emergency. You can kill a snake easily because it moves alone. But when a lion roars, he's signaling to everything in the territory that I ain't by myself. I got cousin Joe, cousin Win, cousin this, cousin that. I got all kinds of cousins. Some of my cousins, they have canines there. They chew your head off. So you better not, not think you'll get away because you see me all alone I am not alone I got my brothers with me I got my sisters with me I got the lionesses I have the lion we have power because we are designed in our uh, uh, mammalian sensibility to never live alone we are better together we do better when we operate as a pride. And a pride is not an unusual term. In fact, it's the correct term. The term pride means we know who we are. We know who we are. That's why they're called pride. Pride Because uh, lions, they look arrogant. They're just confident. They're just organized. They're just dangerous at what they do. Can I give you a little more? So what I'm trying to tell you is that you're going to need people who are and have what you are not and don't have. So let me say it again. You can't fulfill your destiny to which God has called you unless you make sure you are not surrounded by kittens and pussycats. You're going to need to have people around you who have access to capital. Who have qualities where you don't. Who have the wherewithal to complete your asset base and your skill base. Because you can't do everything that a pride does by yourself. 
They have to have multiple talents. You can't be in two places at the same time. That's why you need another. And everyone needs others. Hallelujah. You need people who have access to influence. You need people who have access to knowledge. You need people who have expertise where you don't have expertise. You need people who have more understanding than you do because right now you might be a, a cub that looks like a full-grown lion. And they may be a wise lion on a different level of knowledge and experience. You're going to need other lions that can find you if you're not scared to roar. So that when you roar, within rapid response, there's a team of lions who know how to take care of business. Some of you are silencing your roar. Why? Because you don't want to scare the too many pussycats that are around you. And they certainly don't have a roar because all they do is meow. Other lions will not come running to assist your vision or your dream or your purpose unless you learn how to roar. The roar is a summons to other lions. And by roar, I don't just mean making noise. Lions really don't make noise. They're normally very silent until it's time for business. Lions don't make noise, they make moves. And they don't talk about the move until the move is upon them. Then they roar. So what the lions do, they retreat from the watering hole. Let's say the watering hole is here. And all other animals are looking for the watering hole. And they command the watering hole in their territory. Then when it's time to eat, they retreat from the watering hole. And they position themselves hidden behind fauna so that they can see but they cannot be seen. Then the antelope now has confidence and about 30 of them come down to the watering hole and the jackal and the hyena and the zebra and the kangaroo and the, the, the lion has menu. He's not like a, a giraffe that only eats one kind of thing. He has menu. He has options. And it's what he feels is going to nourish his pride, the cubs included, and his wife or wives, the lioness or the lionesses, that he's going to feed it. So the cubs want to go after and says, no, we're going after four zebra. That's what we need for 40 of us. He says, you guys go around the back, chase them to us. And they're synchronized. They're circular. And they send the big guys out first. And when they attack, and they've, they've taken it by the neck, and they've grabbed it by the esophagus, then everybody else comes in. Then you see the Lion King stroll up. He says, well done, guys. Well done, lasses. <laughs> But lest the lioness think she did it by herself, no, it was the lion that said, I can protect this area. This is our hunting ground. This watering hole is the most used by the zebras, the antelopes, the springbucks, and the like. He chooses the territory. Then he defends it, and then he protects it. Hallelujah. You getting it? See, another lion knows you are a lion when you start talking. Another lion knows that you are a lion when you start roaring. When you start talking about your future and the shared dividends in the future. When you start articulating your vision and you start saying where we are going as a business, as a company, as an industry, as a sector. If you're the president, as a nation. How will the other lions come to, and come to rally to the battle if you don't make a particular kind of sound? A lion knows when you are wrong. They can tell when you're talking vision, talking provision, talking dream, talking future. They can tell whether you are just a meowing kitten or a lion that's about to do some real business a lion that's about to bust a move so if you want to bring other lions into your relational network or your orbit you have to stop meowing and start roaring because you will sometimes have to be willing to roar by yourself until your roar draws your pride go with me to 1st Corinthians 14 and verse 7 and 8 1st Corinthians 14 verse 7 and eight. First Corinthians 14 verse 7 and 8. And even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known that what is piped or harped? Give it to me in the NLT instead. NLT. 
Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. Verse 8. And if the bugler, that's a trumpet, a small trumpet, doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know that they are being called to battle? If your roar doesn't have the sound of deep, deep intention, deep readiness, if it doesn't have that sound of I'm going to get it even if you don't come, the other lions in the pride will not rally to the battle cry. Roar is not just noise. In fact, lions don't make much noise. But when they make noise, it's an intelligent, articulate summons to the rest of the pride. That something that is for all of us is now available to us. And when he roars, it paralyzes for a few seconds the prey. So that they don't get as quick a start as the pride. And the pride come out from the woodworks and they show up. You know why you don't have the help you need? You haven't been roaring. And before you roar, you have to think. The roar is not thoughtless. It's intelligent and therefore it's articulate. And when you roar with a level of conviction, hey, folks are going to hear and they're going to rally to your battle cry. Never listen to a preacher who is not convinced about what he's saying. Never run with anybody who has little or no conviction about what they're asking you to join them and never invest in anybody who doesn't have passion for his purpose. That's why when the lion roars, it comes with power. It comes with passion. Can I go a little further? Let's do some more. So if you want to bring other lions into your network, you're going to have to roar. Don't allow pussy-footed people around you to determine whether or not you roar. Roar until your help comes. Roar until everything that needs to gather to you gathers to you for the cause. You need to roar until the enemies that hear you roar think that your pride is nearby. So they all know in the jungle that if you roar, plenty of people dare your side. In other words, they, don't, they know that if they take you on, they're taking on the whole pride. One for all, all for one. That's a necessary cultural axiom for this house. That if one member calls because they're in trouble, all members need to be available. If one person's in trouble, everybody has to deal with the trouble. It has to be taught. We are better together, not apart. If you're in my pride, your enemy is my enemy. Your friend is my friend. My enemy is your enemy, and my friends are your friends. Lions, if you notice, look carefully, they don't walk on their heels. They walk on their toes. You know why they walk on their toes? They don't use the heels long. A lion can leap 11 meters in one bound. That's 36 feet. And they can reach speeds of 50, some say 55, 60 miles per hour. That means they can get to where your roar is coming from in seconds from where they are positioned. Whether it's trouble that has breached the defense territory or whether it's prey that has presented itself as opportunity. They move on their toes. Why? Because their toes allow them to come with stealth. So by the time they get near the prey, the prey has not hurt them. Because they can tiptoe. And by the time it hears, they're within lunging reach of the prey. So they're deliberately quiet when they're in attack mode. Until the battle lines are drawn and it's ready to attack. Do you get it? This is just the metaphor. So when they break out into their, their acceleration, whether it's a rabbit or a zebra or an antelope, and they like antelope. That antelope is gone. They will take at least three, four, five out. Some of us make too much noise about our project. Empty barrels make the most noise. Keep it quiet. When we were getting ready to build this, I was talking. My bishop called me. He said, Paul, you talk too much. I looked at him. I wanted to say, is it because you're American that you're insulting me like that? He said, just do it. 
don't talk it. Talk it to your people, to your builders, to your capital. But do it. Talk is cheap. Just do it. And when you're about to do it raw, when the money's in your pocket, when the builders are already signed up and the contracts are already done, then raw, more will come. You hear what I'm saying? Some of you talk too soon and you talk too loud. So the enemy already knows all your plans. Cook it well. Cover the pan. Shut the kitchen door. When it is ready, open the door. They will come. Hallelujah. So here's Gideon. Our text. Case study. The background of the story is in chapter 6. And Gideon is a lamb at this time in his life. The Midianites have hired the Amalekites and they've had people from the east and they look like a swarm of locusts. Their camels look more like more than the grain of sand on the seashore. It was an impossible fight. Israel was already beaten before the battle. And there's a little boy, he's a, he's a young man, a young lad as a matter of fact, and he's found a little bit of barley wheat and he doesn't want to thrash it into powder or into flour um, in the public. So he goes to hide in a wine press and he starts threshing his barley into flour so he can hide it from family because they didn't have anything. And whilst he's there, an angel comes to him and says, you mighty man of valor. You're going to deliver all Israel from these troubles. And he said, me, you got the wrong guy. He said, if I'm a mighty man of valor and this is your nation, why are we going through all these things? I like Gideon because he was honest about his incapacity, his incompetence, and his weakness. And that attracted God. And God spends the whole of chapter 6 talking him out of being lamb that his lamb season is temporarily over, that it's now time to be lion. He doesn't see himself as a lion, but the angel of the speaking says, you mighty man of valor. And he says, go now in this thy might. What might? In other words, your fear became the crucible for my power. Your weakness became the crucible for my strength. For in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. This is what God was dealing with that I'm going to use the least likely to do the most mighty. That means if you settle only for being a lamb, you have failed to understand that your lamb nature attracts the power nature of God. Because God loves to use lambs and transform them into lions. Because that is part of his battle strategy, to use the least likely to overwhelm a mighty enemy. Do you get it? So he likes to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wisdom of the wise. He uses the base things of this world to confound the mighty. He uses weaklings to throw down giants. Samson was not some big strong guy. Samson was a scrawny little fellow. That's why they asked, where does his strength lie? It was not apparent. Do you get it? And so by the time we get to the end of chapter 6, this boy is not a lamb anymore. That lamb, he has parked it in the garage. That's not his active space. But when he comes up and he sees the battle, he's afraid. And one of his last arguments with God, after he has agreed to follow God to this battle, he acknowledges that, Gideon, I know you're afraid because you just got to look at the plains where the battle array of the Midianites and their coalition has been set up. And anybody who saw that, even if you had said yes to God, you would say, God, can I have a second chance to say no? It's like when we started this building. When it started and the problem started coming, I said, God, are you sure? Should we not just sell it as a museum? <laughs> you, you hear what I'm saying? Do you get it? Eventually, he acquiesces. And God does something for him. I have to tell you this. I'm going to take an extra 10. Um, what he does he says, Gideon, if you are afraid, go down to the camp of the Midianites and listen to what they are saying about you. And if you're really that afraid, take Pura, your servant, with you. And together they went into the camp of the Midianites by night. And as they arrived, one warrior 
was sharing a dream he had just woken up from with his fellow warrior. And the dream was that there was a loaf of barley bread that tumbled down from the heights of the Israelites and knocked down one of the tents in Midian, or where the Midianites were. And he asked his friend, what does it mean? He said, it means that uh, Gideon is going to have great victory over the Midianites in battle. Hallelujah. In one series of conversations, I think about five, God gave Gideon such a dreaded name that the Midianites at the command level were scared of the boy. I don't know who you are, but God's about to give you a brand name that's going to shake the territory, open the doors for you, and convince you that what looked impossible to you is going to become easy for you. The anointing that makes what you thought was difficult is going to make it so easy for you that the anointing itself will encourage you who am i talking to this morning oh that amen doesn't sound strong enough so let's go to the instruction in the text so here is gideon he's ready to go and look at what god says to him as he has gone down into the camp of the midianites he says go get up for god has given you the victory over the midianites they haven't even fought the battle yet. God says, I've given you the victory. I want to prophesy to you, House on the Rock. I don't know who in particular you are, but there are many of you here. There's a victory that is awaiting you to make your first move. It's already yours. It's just waiting for you to make the first move. Make your move. Don't let two months pass without you making your move. That is about 60 days must not pass without you making your move. Your move might be your role. It might be gathering your pride. It might be gathering your senior team. It might be gathering your various components and assets for the job that needs to be done. Do it within the next two months. That means you've got work to do. You've got research to do. You've got feasibility studies to do. You've got all those things to get done. You have to travel, meet some people, make certain connections. Don't just talk it. Do it. Don't just speak about it to your friends. Speak about it to people who are action men and women. And if you don't find men, brothers, find women. They will do it. Just tell them what their share is. Can I go further? So what he does, as soon as he hears from God, he roars. And when he roars, the battle warriors of about five tribes come together and there are 32,000 warriors available to Gideon. 32,000 was not as big as the army of the Midianites, but it was still a significant number. And besides, Israel had a reputation from the days of the Red Sea. Glory to God. And what you must then understand is that he was happy that he had 32,000. And he was going to go to battle with those 32,000. And he's excited now. He's at the peak of his passion for the job. But God tells him this. He says, You've got too many. I don't have to save by many. I can save by many of you. You've got far too many people. Go to verse 2 of chapter 7. Verse 2 of chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel brag about themselves or vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. God wants you to make sure that you understand that this battle, the way you win, is more important than that you win. Because if you win on your own strength, you will go to the next battle and lose. Because it is not your strength that wins the battle, it is my strength in your weakness. So, the end does not justify the means. And I want you to understand that because the win exposes you. But the way, the way, it teaches you how to win. That God is your victory factor in battle. Otherwise, you go to the next battle thinking that it was my strength that did this for me and you'll get beat up. David was not exposed. It was the wind that exposed him. 
But his way was approved by God in two earlier battles. He knew that it was God. And he said, it was God who helped me to kill the lion and kill the bear. Therefore, this same God he will help me to deal with the giant. The way you win is more important than the fact that you win. And just because you won on your own strength doesn't mean that God is going to support you in the next battle. Ask Israel. When they conquered Jericho, they were proud. And they went to go and try and conquer Ai, and they lost because they did not do it in their strength. Sorry, they did it in their strength. Hallelujah. Number two, he says to them, all the guys who are afraid, tell them to go home to their wives. In other words, their pussycats, <laughs> their kittens. They're only going to meow. Send them home. And guess how many left? 22 of 32,000, leaving Gideon with 10,000. Gideon is looking. His, his army, the Midianite army. <laughs> Baba, can we talk? 10,000, only 10,000. You've got number two, you've got to let God pick your pride for you. Don't pick your pride yourself because he knows how to choose preemptively the, the right people for the job. Let him be the synergy behind your selection. This is critical. He has to select your friends because you don't see around the corner that you're going to. He knows the corner. He knows around the corner. And he knows the people around you. He knows when they will change. He knows what they're like. When the fiercest of battle comes, he knows exactly how they are going to handle it. Let me pick your friends for you. If you really mean business, don't choose your partners yourself. Let God choose them for you and test it. One good thing about Gideon, he tested everything God said to him. He said, I don't mean to be rude, but look at me now. <laughs> Is it me you want to send to battle? Do I look like a soldier to you? Whereas that was God's objective, to use somebody who didn't look the part, who didn't sound the part, but who was sold out to God and was willing to imbibe the sense of responsibility. So he says, got 10,000. He says, okay, let's go. He says, no, I still need to choose. Take them down to the watering hole and observe how they meet their needs. Check them out to see how they meet their needs. And 9,700 put their four feet inside the shoreline and put their whole snout in the water and were drinking like dogs. But there was another group. They're looking at the battlescape and they use the dexterity of one hand without changing their vision to give themselves the opportunity to drink. They could quench their thirst with dexterity. They could meet the local need with dexterity without taking their eye off the battle. Do you get it? Anybody around you who can't meet his own needs without being fully consumed by need, that he's not consumed about destiny and vision, he's not on your team. Yes, sir. And then anybody who moves because of what they're thirsty for, which in this country is normally money, don't use them for your vision. They'll stab you in your back when the price is right because they can be bartered on the marketplace of the price is right. People will leave in a hurry because the money is right. But the role might be wrong. The agenda might be wrong. What it does to you and changes you and perverts you might be wrong. Are we talking? Look at three people. Tell them stay in the kingdom. Some people start businesses just because of money. Some people start churches just because of money. Some people marry the husband just because of money. Some husbands marry the wife because of her father's money. It never works. It doesn't work. Anything that really makes money normally started out with passion for purpose. And that's why they're able to keep reinvesting the capital 
by delayed gratification to keep increasing the dividends to the business because their passion and their thrill is the business's success, not monetary gain. You see, you're not meant to chase money. Otherwise, money owns you. Wherever money goes, you go. But you are meant to chase God. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his type of righteousness and all these things, including money, shall be added to you. So money is for purpose. It's called provision. Pro means for. Vision means your agenda. The God-given agenda that he gave you. Are we there? And once they had that right, so, so what it means is that if you lose a bit of money, you're not going to get scared. It just means readjust your focal priorities to the exactness of the vision and the money will return. If God gave you the vision, he will give you the provision. That's just how simple it is. So money surrounds God and God enables purpose. So if you follow the God of purpose and the purpose of God, everything you need, the human assets and the capital assets will follow you. It's simple. But if your binge is, I must make money, money will control you and your generations for a long time. And that's not a good thing. For mammon to be your God, it makes God very angry. Are we there? You've been listening quite well. So he has 300 people on his team now. Just 300. 300. And he's going up against scores of thousands. What, how are you going to win a battle on 300? This is another important point. Let me phrase it this way. Never compromise excellence. And always execute with order there must be order to your excellence so what does Gideon do he takes his 300 he says 100 go this way by the flank that's lion like another hundred go this way by the flank and then my hundred we will go to the center and then he gives them clear instructions with precision he says take in one hand a jar a pitcher and it will have a torch, a lantern, or a lamp in it. And in the other hand, you've got to have your sword. That's why they were tested at the water. You've got to be able to be dexterous, use both hands. And as a warrior, you have to know whether your right cross is stronger than your left hook. So when you're in battle, you ne never present your weaker side to the enemy. You've got to know what your abilities are and your capacities are and play to your strengths. And your strengths to cover your neighbor's weakness. So you don't do what you're not good at in battle because the lives of th at least 32,000 men and their wives and their children are at stake because you put the weak hand to the battle. So have somebody cover your weak hand with their strong hand and use your strong hand to cover somebody else's weak hand. And don't always play your best assets on D-Day. Because if you play your best asset on D-Day, that asset is always going to think I'm the one who's supposed to be used on D-Day. So when he's not used on D-Day, he thinks there's something wrong. And if some assets can't sit down, they're not on the team. Because some people's job, like David said, there's some guys, their job is to stay with the supplies. Because if there's nobody with supplies, then when we need supplies, we're not going to have it. That's why the army does not only have combatants. They have education corps, they have engineering corps, they have supplies and ordinances. They have all of that, signals. These are not necessarily combatants. But they are necessary in battle. Can I hear from the military? Okay. So, he then says, this is the battle strategy. You've got to have a strategy. I think that's number five. I won't remember the order. Uh, and by strategy, what that means is, we're not going to fight. Because God has said he has already given us the victory. So what are we going to do? I'm going to get up there and I'm going to shout the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And everybody on all three flanks will say exactly the same thing. At that point, you're going to use your sword to break the pitcher. And they're going to hear a noise that looks like AK-47, which they did not have in that day. 
And at the same time, they hear this noise from three flanks. They're going to feel surrounded. Now, this looked like thousands and thousands and thousands of camels in the camp of Midian. And here you have just 300 warriors. More is less in the mind of God. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Less is more in the mind of God. He can win by less or by more. But in this case, he chose to use less. And once they broke the, the, the pictures, light started to shine from three different areas. And you hear these roaring lions. And guess what happens? They didn't have to fight. Midian and Amalek and all their friends from the east, they ran. Then he roars again and calls about five other tribes says, chase them down. And that's how he won the battle. I'm going to give you these points very quickly. I'm listing them. I can't teach them because my time is against me. Number one, treasure how you win, not that you win. And under number one, the end does not justify the means. Otherwise, you think it was your own ability that won you the last battle and therefore you might lose the next battle. Number two, let God pick your pride for you. He reduced it from 32 to 10,000, 32,000 to 10,000. And how did he choose? He separated the altruists from the narcissists. Narcissists are the guys who everything is about them. The altruists, everything is about God and his kingdom. That was David. That was Gideon. That was Deborah. Number three, God can do much more with less. So that three lions are more powerful than 30,000 kittens. So it's what you put in your 300 that makes them tougher than 30,000. You don't have to be many. The people who wrote the apartheid regime and its principle, there were just five guys in a wine farm between Stellenbosch and Johannesburg. Four or five guys wrote the new South African system up and they determined the outcome of South Africa uh, that gave equality and majority principle back to South Africans. The Israelis, it was four or five guys who sat down and planned Israel. And most generally, anywhere around the world, the value systems of a nation were chosen and debated amongst a small handful of people. Then they pushed it out. Because once you have a cabinet of like 12 or 15 or 20, and there isn't a benevolent dictator in the midst of that, you're going to get too many views and ideas. You need people who think alike, who see alike, and God must be the invisible chairman of the endeavor. That way, his purpose crystallizes. Are you there? And just four guys or four lionesses can plant something and it will shake all of Africa. Oh, you, I did, you didn't. A divine idea, they say, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. What's going to rule tomorrow in Nigeria is ideas, not men. If you have the right idea, we can create a revolution in this country of industry, of thought, of progress, of advancement, and of evolution. That Nigeria will evolve out of the, out of the mayhem and the quagmire that she's sitting in. It's ideas. I was talking to some crypto guys yesterday. One, one of our guys met the greatest influencer in crypto. And it's been the greatest thing that has happened for him lately. But what's powerful about it is it's just ideas. Just simple ideas. And what technology has done, it has opened up the arena for ideas to spread so that the world is no longer nations. It's one single village. Technology has removed borders and boundaries. This building was an idea. The nature of the building was an idea. God put it in one person's head. He called four or five people. They sat down and said, how can we do this? How will we do it? When will we do it? What do we need to do it? And once those questions were answered, the building moved over a small period of time from abstract to concrete and air conditioning. Ideas? What you need to have is ideas. And ideas on three people will multiply massively. Ideas. Beg God to give you ideas. 
Thank you for making our time to listen to this message. For additional information of this and other ministry products by Pastor Paul Adefawasin, please contact us on 01 461 4120 or 01 